Welcome to Brain and Avert. We are delighted to be joined by Rivka Weinberg, and we're going to be talking about procreative ethics. Rivka, would you like to start with some thought experiments? Yes, I'd like to start with two. Each one illustrates a different way, different framework of looking at procreative ethics, and I think they both have they're both flawed, and I and which will lead me to explain the framework that I have, which I of course think is not flawed. The first framework, I'll, the first case I'll discuss is Parfit's non-identity problem. So let's say that you that you're a fourteen-year-old girl and she wants to have a child to love or whatever reason she has. And you're trying to talk her out of it because, of course, it's not good for her. That's one way of talking her out of it. But you also think it's not good for a child to have a 14-year-old mother for all the reasons we know. And so you try to explain this to her. And she says, but if I put off having a child till I'm 24, the child I would have had at 14 is no better off. That child would never exist. And so you do this child no favor by putting, by delaying your procreation to a more responsible time. And you do this child no wrong. It's not wrong to have a 14 year old mother because you wouldn't have a 14 year old mother. You wouldn't exist at all. And so you have no, and if your existence is worthwhile on balance, you have no complaints to your 14 year old mother for not waiting till she was 24. That wouldn't do you any good. That's one way of looking at the not procreative ethics. And that's a very permissive way. It, it, it implies an, a very low standard of procreative care that the only thing you have to do in order to permissibly procreate is make sure that your children have a life that's worth living on balance or likely to have that life. I think that's a mistake. And I think it's a mistake because nobody needs to exist. So the 14 year old can say, of course, it's bad for me to have a 14 year old mother. So what if I wouldn't exist otherwise, and we wouldn't be talking about it, I wouldn't have a good at all. So that your existence itself is just the scale on which we weigh the goods and the bad things in your life it's not hanging in the balance and it can't be used to justify procreative negligence. So that's one case. The other case is intended is directed at the view that procreation is almost always wrong because life is bad. David Benatar has this view. Life is bad, meaning it's a bad, it's just bad for people. It's contrary to human well-being. It's contrary to to it's and it's a life of suffering. And then people say to Benatar, but people are happy. And he's like, they're deluded to be happy. So here's the other case to address that. Let's say we were running an experiment to satisfy our curiosity, and we we're going to design and create, we'll call them peeps, sentient, conscious, intelligent beings who have everyday enjoyable experiences, and but they also suffer a lot. Some of them lead lives of great anguish. They experience mental suffering, physical suffering, all kinds of suffering and joy. But a lot of the times they interpret their suffering and they're like, no, but it doesn't matter. They attribute meaning to it. I learned from it. It's all beautiful or something like that. And if you ask them as they're like wincing from the pain, whether they're glad to exist, they're going to be like, of course. And if you point out that they're wincing, they'll say, yeah, but at other times I'm dancing and laughing or I need to win sometimes in order to appreciate the great things. Some of them don't feel this way. Some even kill themselves, but most of them don't. Are we doing anything wrong by running this experiment? You might say, of course, we're making people suffer and it's only adding insult to injury that we wire, that we make them masochistic or wire just weirdly enough to, in, to derive enjoyment from it. But other people are not even clear why we're asking the question. They're like, what's suffering? Enjoyment isn't suffering. And so the point of this thought experiment is to show that you can't argue like Benatar does, that there's some objective way to decide whether life is that life is bad for people, even if they think it's good. You have no sort of special authority or special knowledge to say this, and it doesn't make sense to say this. So you cannot say on that basis, maybe there's other basis, on that basis that having children is always wrong. Those are the two frameworks that I think are extreme and a mistake. The framework I have instead is I think of procreation as a case of imposing a risk. You impose the risk of a life and all the good things and bad things that could happen on the future person that you're going to be creating. And the risks differ depending on the likely circumstances and on your circumstances. And then we can judge it the way we judge other cases of risk and position. So let's have a look at your case where we're determining whether it's right or wrong to bring a new being into existence based on the risks. Mm -hmm. Now, if I could remove the risk factor and give you a certainty, which is that it is certain that your child will have on balance more pain than pleasure in their lives. Would that be a reason not to have the child? The reason I this I don't like the scale you're using, which is hedonistic measuring pleasure and pain, but the basic concept behind it, I would agree with. So what I say is let's look at, 
I, I look at it in a different way because what, when you're imposing a risk on somebody, generally speaking, we look, in order to assess whether that's permissible, we say, what are the costs to you of not imposing the risk? Let's say of not driving a car. What are the costs to the person if the risk blossoms into a harm, if you hit somebody? And then we decide benefits and burdens. So let's take the same kind of case, even though we don't. So we say, what are the risks that you're imposing on the child? compared to the burden of you of not having children. Let's say we say, no, it's too, you, so you have to, those are the ways you compare it. And the way I think you can do that more easily is to say, would it be rational for me to accept the risk I'm imposing on my child in order for the freedom to procreate, which is what I'm deriving from it. And that's how you weigh it out. If it would not be rational, here's a case where I think it's not rational. Let's say you already have a child or even two children, which is hard to justify, even though I have two children. And you, you want to have a third child. And then you say, and you're already, let's say, 42. And the risk of having a Down syndrome baby when you're 42 is pretty substantial, although it's still more likely that they're not going to have Down syndrome. And you say, would it be worth it? Would it be rational for me to accept, let's say, the 20% risk or whatever risk it is of me suffering from Down syndrome in order to have the freedom to procreate and have a third child at 42? I think the answer is no. It would not be rational. Because you already, what is the great benefit of having a third child at 42 when you're already a mother, you already have this special kind of relationship, you already have two children. It's not such a great benefit. And the cost of having Down syndrome is very high. Now, some people think it's not very high that I'm ableist. I disagree with that. I think you have cognitive deficits, you have physical deficits. And I think there's an objective, a lowering quality of well-being for that. And that would be an example of a risk that is not worth it, not justified. In my opinion, just appropriation in that case would not be justified under the framework of a risk assessment. So I just want to push risk. on something, which is how we're balancing the risks. There seems to be some kind of ambiguity as whether it's the risks to the child or the risk for, in other words, the benefit that the parent has in relation to the child. So let me give you a case. Let's say you're the kind of person who just loves being pregnant and doesn't really like raising kids. And lucky for you, you and your husband are take, take sex carriers. And so you'll produce a child. You will have the joy of the pregnancy. Your child will be born and will die very soon afterwards. And you say, I'm just so lucky because I get the pregnancy. I don't have to do any child rearing. The risks to me are minimal. The chance of me having a non tay sex kid are very low. So I'm just going to keep doing this uh, ad finitum until I can no longer do it. Maybe I didn't explain myself well, because that's, that would not be permissible under the principles that I'm describing. I try to make it an, in, an intrapersonal kind of conflict so that it's easy to weigh out. And I would say, would it be worth, is it rational for me to accept the risk of being a Tay-Sachs child, that my mother would have done this to me? I would be born with Tay-Sachs in order for the benefit of being able to enjoy a pregnancy. That is not a worthwhile risk. So I think that's the one move you can make, right, which is different from asking from this perspective of the child. It might be that you say, I'm the kind of person who I'm emboldened by risks. I love taking risks. The chance of me getting of dying on a motorcycle or what makes me do it. So I'm willing to take on all those risks. That seems like a strange paradigm because you're dealing with another human being. So that being might say, I really would have preferred if you didn't take these risks with my existence, given what you knew. The fact that you were willing to take those risks, you know, is neither here nor there. You've got to ask it from the perspective of this impartial being. So I agree with you that you need an objective standard. And so what I would say a risk is irrational if everybody would have reason not to take it. And I also define, so you have to define what counts as a good. I talk about procreative goods, being able to have physical health, nourishment, an ability for an education, social interaction. So I define it in certain ways such that if you are an outlier, that that gets that that does not factor in. It's not a subjective assessment. Um, it's it, so there is a constraint on the kinds of goods that count as procreative goods, and it's an objective standard of sort of. If I think about welfare, I'm an objectivist, sort of like an Aristotelian Nussbaum sent objectivist theory of human welfare. So it's not subject to that because that would be that would be unfair to the future child. It's not your fault that your parent has this weird or unusual preferences that would not. So that's how I would avoid that outcome. So I'm halfway there with you, Rivka. As a probabilistic utilitarian, I love the idea of assessing mm -hmm. whether a particular action now is right or wrong based on the probabilities of X or Y occurring later. And I really like that. But then you threw away my lovely hedonism, right? So you replaced it with, you, re you replaced it with these sort of 
rewards and benefits and you took away the pre pleasure pain calculus and you replaced it with a rationality calculus. And then there's other problems that come in. So one of the problems is that if you look at the science around and the economics around decision-making, there is no objective principle for how to determine risk in a certain situation. So what I mean by that, when you have a lottery that you have to decide whether you're going to take or not. So let's say you have to choose between two lotteries. So in lottery one, you've got an 80% chance of winning $1,000, but you've also got a 20% chance of losing $200. You've got another lottery, lottery B, where you've got a 50% chance of winning $2,000 and a 50% chance of losing $2,000. How do you decide which lottery is the rational one to take? There's different principles, right? So there's a pure utility calc where you multiply the gains by the probability of the gain and you multiply the loss by the probability of the loss and you add them all up and you come to a decision. But there's lots of other principles and there's not, in at least according to economists, there's not some over overarching method, some objective measure that we can use to say that one principle is better than another. So then I start to think more along the lines that Mark does. So I think, well, it seems to be up to each person the rubric that they use to determine the calculus for what kind of risks they're willing to take. So some people be more risk averse, some people be more risk aggressive. Which is the right option? Which is the rational option? It doesn't seem like there's really an answer to that. But if you come back to my lovely hedonistic probabilistic utilitarianism, there's a built-in calculus, right? It's you just weigh the pleasure and pain. If on balance there's going to be more pleasure than, or at least a greater chance of pleasure, <clears throat> then you pursue that. Oh, so you could, if you wanted to, if you thought, I don't agree with hedonism, I think it's too simplistic. And I don't think your calculus works, even because I don't think you're able to, the currency, the cashing out, I don't think is really doable. But if you could apply it to what I'm, you could apply it to the what I'm, to my principles, and just use hedonism as your level of well-being, as your measure of well-being. You could do that. In now, there is more than one rational approach to risk. That's definitely the case. And I do discuss that in, in my, my, my work on procreative ethics and in my book. So to, to guard against that, I say, okay, you, I take a more permissive stance, which maybe you would want to take a less permissive stance. But, but the principle I say is you, if it would be irrational to make this choice, if everyone would have a reason against it based on what I think are procreative goods, then you can't do it. Otherwise, you can't do it. So that, so, and it is also possible that there are cases that will be harder to, ju to judge or will be in a gray area, but this is the way I, this is the framework that I think fits to the thing you're doing when you create a person. So let's try and think about some of the risks that will be present for this being brought into existence. It seems like there's a whole bunch we don't know. Maybe you have some sense of what your life was like and what your other kids' lives were like, and you can assume that your kid will go in this direction. You could do some genetic testing. You could get a sense of whether they're going to have a disease. And so you'd have some sense of which risks you could avoid. But life is chaotic and there's many bad things that can happen out of the blue. Your kid could be in a car accident and be maimed for the rest of their life. They could be assaulted, they could be murdered, they could be raped. All these horrible things could happen to them. None of those things would happen if they were never brought into existence. And so even if you think that on average, life tends towards some positive number, either there's just more pleasure than pain or there's more objective goods on the list, the chances that something bad could happen to them even if it doesn't result, exposing them to that risk seems like a moral hazard. And that seems like a very strong reason for not bringing them to existence. I think if you people now let's look at risk and positions generally. You can drive safely and be a good driver, not be drunk, and still kill someone. It's a terrible outcome. You can't guard against it. But we still allow you to impose the risk because we think the burden to you would be greater than the harm you're exposing the other person to, the potential victim to, and that's how we weigh it out. It is still more morally conservative not to have children, not to drive a car. That is, I agree with that. So I think that it is only our very strong interest in having a child that could justify imposing this sort of a risk at all. 
And I think there are lingering antinatalist worries, one of the kind you describe, that make not having children certainly the more morally conservative course of action. Nobody needs to be born. So if you want to really be more conservative, make sure you're never doing something wrong. You won't drive a car, let's say, then you have to do other things. So that's a little bit different because it exposes other risks. Maybe it's more complicated, but not having a child. Yeah, that is more, that is a more morally conservative course of action for sure. It is only justified because of how much it could mean to you to do it. And you have to, and you, then you make your, make your best guess and you try to set a standard of care, like be an adult, have enough, enough money to support them, things like that, the same way you do with driving a car. But basically, I agree, you cannot guard against all harmful outcomes, and therefore it is more morally conservative not to have children. So one of our previous guests, his name's Connor Kianpur, he holds the view that when you're determining where a child will be raised, it's only the child's interests that should matter and not the parent's interests. Now, I'm not saying I agree with this view. I disagree with this view. But what's interesting about your position is it sounds like it's both the parent's interests that matter and the child's interests that matter. Because when you discuss the driving case, it's both the driver and the potential victim of the car accident that matter. But the driver seems to be weighted quite heavily, at least half. So so the, the question is, how do you respond to people who say we should disregard parents' interests entirely when making decisions about children. We should only care about children's interests. I just don't see why that would be the case. Everybody counts. So I don't know why you would discount. You might say that, and I don't know the argument about where people should live, or but you might say that in certain cases, there's the responsibility from parent goes from parent to child, not the other way around. So that's one way of discussing who has to take care of who, let's say. But to think that everybody, you could have a print that every parent has to do the best they can for their child. I don't think that's true. What if the best you can take so much out of you and a little bit less would be fine? So I don't see a rationale for saying that the parents should just not count. They're people also. I don't know why they wouldn't count. So I don't see that. I'm not persuaded by that point of view. So Connor's claim comes in an episode we did on parental licensing. And he says there's two different ways we can understand parental licensing. The one is that in order to procreate, you have to have a license. So you can imagine that every young girl gets fitted with Mirena, and once you pass a test, we take the Mirena out, and now you're allowed to have kids. That's not the view that he argues in favor of. He argues in favor of a separate view, which is once you've had the kid, you should have a license to determine whether you get to raise it. Now, I wonder, given that people, let's say, will expose their children to different kinds of risks, either through bringing them into the world. Maybe they've got various genetic issues that could lead to the kid being born in a worse off way, or that they're going to be the kinds of people who would raise their children in some negligent fashion. Whether you think that we could have either of those two parental licensing schemes, whether that'd be permissible or required. So I think that's really a question about, that's not to me a purely moral question. That becomes a political question because who's going to, you're, who's going to, who's going to grant the license? So when you're, when you give powers to the state, you have to worry about the political powers of the state and how they're going to be. And so I think that ex, that exposes everybody to a lot of potential abuses and problems. Do you want the state to be in your light, to have the power over your deepest choices like that? And so it's it sounds great, like some kind of panacea, let's have a license, but it's not simply like, can you drive a car? There, there are many more points of disagreement, many more ways in which the power can be abused. It has such a deep power in your life that I think that although I can see the attraction of those kinds of views, I think that they're naive and not appreciating how bad it could go. Who's going to do this judging? So I would not be in favor of that. At risk of trying to defend a view I really don't believe, I think his argument for the claim relies on something like this intuition, <clears throat> that children are a powerless group compared with their parents, and so we should always hold the interests of powerless groups, at least relatively powerless groups, to be more important. We should always weigh them heavier. Yeah, I think that's the wrong conclusion to draw from the powerlessness. I agree that children are particularly vulnerable, so we should look out for them. We should have, let's say, child abuse laws that are more stringent as opposed to the horror or more enforced. We should 
try to teach people how to, we should, in high school, we should teach child development so parents know what to expect. Child rape, there's other things that we can do to protect, you protect the vulnerable. You don't say that their interests are more important than someone else's interests. All people are of equal moral value. So I think that is the wrong solution to the problem that he's talking about. The problem of vulnerability is protection, not greater moral importance. So I want to turn to something you alluded to in your first thought experiment, the non-identity problem. There's a view that we have obligations to beings that don't yet exist, that we should be custodians of the environment, that we should create a world full of justice, not for ourselves, but for these future generations. Do you think we can owe these beings something given that they don't yet exist? Yes, but I think it's complicated. And I've written a lot on this topic metaphysically. I think we can, we, I, so there's different ways to divide up the ontological grounds. The way I think is the clearest is to say, there are people who do exist. There are people who will exist. We don't know who they are, but they will. And then there are people who could exist, but won't. Like the fourth child I chose not to have. That's like, I would call that a merely possible person. Possible in theory, but will never exist. A future person is someone who will exist in the future. We just don't know which particular person it would be or some or something like that. A future person is a person. They count just like you count. And so I think we do owe things to future people if we know if we have a good reason to think they're going to be there. Sometimes we have epistemic problems. Like what will future people need? Will they need oil or will they have converted to a different form of should we conserve coal or should we not worry about it because we're switching to solar? That's, a, that's an epistemic problem of how do you properly attend to the interests of future people. But I don't think we owe anything to, let. you might think, well, you should have as many children as you can have that will have a good life. I don't think so because the risk is always there, but that's it. But besides for that, I don't think you owe anything to a to a merely potential being whom you choose not to create. You only chose, so you, you have a, you, and this kind of clears up something else called the procreation asymmetry, which is you can't, you shouldn't have a child that's going to be miserable, but you don't have to have a child that's going to be, that would be happy. And how do you explain that? I find that very easy to explain. If a child would be happy if they were born, but you never have them, there is no subject for this loss or deprivation. It is a merely possible person that does not count. It's a fiction. Um, it's a notion. If you have a child that's going to suffer and you have that child, then you have a real victim. These are a live future person that's going to suffer. So that's how I think, that's why I divide people into actual, merely possible, and future. And I do away with the category of possible, which combines merely possible and future people. Because the, mere, the future people that could exist but won't, they don't count. Whoever's going to exist, they're real people and we have full responsibilities to them. So if I understand correctly, you have responsibility towards a future person that you choose to bring into the world, but not a responsibility to someone who you don't choose to bring into the world. Is that correct? Depend who will exist or won't exist. Sometimes a person will exist. Let's say you're, and the word choice is making me pause here because I, there could be future people that I don't bring into the world because I choose not to have children, but like my, my sister is going to have children and I shouldn't like wreck let's say our family compound or the environment in general, other people's children count also because they're future people, just like any other person. So it's, if we're, whoever will exist, we have obligations to, if anyone chooses to bring them in, I think to into existence, not just you. Okay. Fair enough. Now think about this case. So I come to you, I'm God. And I come to you, Rivka, and I say to you, we live in a deterministic world, and I can tell you for sure that if you have a child tonight, that child will become a great doctor who will save humanity. It's deterministic from the point of your choice onwards. But you could choose not to have a child tonight, and then you won't bear that great doctor of humanity that will cure all the cancers and find amazing genetic treatments and etc. So they're really going to bring about a lot of good. It feels like you're doing something wrong if you choose not to have the child that night, especially if you have no strong reason not to. Suppose it's like, I could have the child tonight or tomorrow night. It doesn't really matter to me. I've been given the, I've got access to the knowledge about the future, for sure, 100% sure. It seems like you are failing in some duty or you're doing something wrong by not bringing into existence the doctor. But on your view, you wouldn't be because they never would have existed if you choose not 
to have you that. Would not, your obligation, if you have one in that case, first of all, if you're God, we have a lot of things to talk about. determinism. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot to answer for. But the future, but if your obligation, I think your intuition in this case is your obligation, not to that doctor who doesn't need to exist, but to the other future people to whom I agree that you're obligated. So this is just a very magical way of being able to have a very positive effect on future people. I think you are obligated to future people. So I think it is conceptually possible that this could be part of your obligation, not to the doctor who doesn't need to exist, but maybe you could do this great thing for future people that you might be obligated to do. But your obligation would be to the people that, to the future people that will exist, that this doctor that could exist or not would help. Okay, so let me just rephrase the thought experiment because you're absolutely right. That's the correct conclusion of your view. But but suppose I were to rephrase it such that if you have this child tonight, there'll be a whole different set of people coming about in future because of some chaotic situation. Everyone's embryos get shifted slightly and there'll be a whole different set of people such that those people will live incredibly happy lives. Versus if you have a child tomorrow night, you're going to have a different baby and a whole lot of other different future people will ensue. And those people will live very unhappy lives. Do you have an obligation to bring about the one rather than the other? I don't, maybe I'm missing something, but this seems very similar to the prior case. I would say you could have an obligation and it would be to the future people that will exist. And those few, because you never know who they are. So it's to this generic set. And if you're going to, so why wouldn't you do the thing that would make the future better for the people who will exist in the future? I find that not inconsistent with my view. So maybe I'm missing some of the question. So in my original thought experiment, you've got the doctor existing or not, but the same set of people around him. Whereas in the second thought experiment, you've got a different set of people. And so I think that gets around your solution. Okay. So that's like you do X gives you the X people, Y gives you the Y people. And so you're still obligated to future people. And then let me think about this case. I think I'm starting to see the difference. So then who are the future people going to be? So you could argue that, and I think that, and I think a lot of times you have to think of it this way, that you're, that, that you're obligated to future people in the wide sense of whoever will, I mean, the de dicto sense of whoever will fill that role. But it's still, I'm not sure that I'm fully still answering you because we're questioning the sets. So if you're setting population policy, should you pick principle A or principle B? A gives you the A people who have worse lives. B gives you the B people who have better lives. You pick B and you get the people who have better lives because you're making things better for whoever exists in the future, even though what you're doing also determines who exists in the future. So I think that they don't have to come apart. I haven't given this case a lot of thought, so I'm answering just on the fly. And I think maybe I would want to think about it more. But I think that's the direction I would want to go in, in looking at our obligations on a policy way and a wide lens. I haven't thought about it carefully either, but I wonder if you go that way, whether you're not committed to some sort of really far-flung wacky view that you're basically committed to future persons always, no matter who they are. And who they are, if they're determined by your choices, means every choice you ever make involves deep responsibility. And you don't want that view. You just want to say you're only responsible for actual future persons. I think maybe this will help. I think maybe one difference is that I'm not at all utilitarian. So I don't think you're responsible for the world and for states of affairs. And so I think your responsibility is much narrower. And maybe that will help me get away from this deep. I don't think I have deep responsibilities in general to everybody. Because I think like, it's not my fault I was born into the world. It's this big mess and I don't have to clean it up. I wrote a paper about that once. It's called It Ain't My World. And that's what I think. So I think our obligations are much narrower based on our level of responsibility. But again, I don't think I would, I have to think about your case a little more, but I think I would answer along those lines. And maybe our intuitions are different based on our different views about responsibility and being more agent centered versus agent neutral. And that would be one of the differences. So I wonder about this. If the view is that actual possible future people, so people who will exist that don't yet exist, are equal to us, but there will be many more of them. If we think humanity is going to exist for a long time until we get burned up by the sun, it seems like given how strong those interests are, maybe you don't have to do a totting up exercise, but it seems like the obligations you have to all of those people must outweigh the obligations you have to yourself or to everyone who currently exists. And so I wonder how you avoid that if you want to say that they're equal. 
besides going down a nearest rabbit hole, you say, oh, everyone, nothing. Uh, no, I think you avoid that by not being a consequentialist. You avoid so many problems in life if you don't take the stupid view of being in a utilitarian. You're just, I'm not responsible to everyone who ever, I'm not, I don't add people up that way. So I, my sort of obligations are narrower and weaker and I don't have to say there's so many of them and only one of me. I'm a lot of, I'm a lot of prioritize myself and my children. And so I think you, you avoid a lot of the problems in that way. Plus, you can also, you also don't know, so your ignorance gets you off the hook a little bit. You don't know how many people, you know, who's going to exist and what they're going to, but if let's say no for sure, it could change the calculus, but you don't. And that's one of the reasons, again, I think one of the faults of consequentialism is it forces you into this, into this business of predicting the future, which we're so terrible at. So that, I don't think Kantian, sort of Kantian slash Rawlsian maybe Aristotelian sometimes like me, I don't think I have the same sort of problem that you have, that, that a consequentialist would have. This is like Parfit's repugnant conclusion. You should have as many people as possible so that with a small level of well-being, because they all add up. But if you are a deontologist, then nobody's value adds up because each person is one person. And when you have 20 people, you just have 20 ones. So Mark will join you in the utilitarianism bashing. I get it regularly on the show. <laughs> but I, what I want to do is not defend utilitarianism, but defend one implication of utilitarianism. So Mill said that everyone's head-ons count. So you should add up everyone's utility when making your decisions. But he didn't go so far as to say that everyone is equally valuable or equally important. So it, that's a claim that you've made quite a few times in the discussion. So you've talked about how the parents' interests matter just as much as the children's interests and how everyone's interests in a future world matter equally, but not necessarily to, I'm not fully responsible for those because they're distant from me, fair enough. But I just want to question that claim that everyone has equal value or equal importance. Why do you think that's the case? Everyone, so I think there's a different one of the reasons that Mill just says everybody's hedons add up because he thinks about states of affairs. He's not thinking about the utilitarians want to maximize the state of affairs. They're not looking at how it's at each person. When I say everyone is of equal moral value, that means that they have a special status as a person that constrains the way I am able to treat them. I can't use them for my purposes. I can't poke their eyes out for no reason. It's a constraint based on a status. It doesn't run, so I don't run into these problems. Because that's what I mean, and that's what deontologists mean when they say everybody is of equal value. It means everyone has a special moral status that constrains the way you can treat them, but it's not that everyone's happiness, you have to pursue it the same as your own. Like those things don't, those are, that's just not the way deontological ethics works. So I wonder if you're in this situation where you say, look, I don't have to add up the well-being of all these future generations. So I don't actually have to care about the environment. I'm not using these people as a means to anything. They don't exist yet. So I can trash the environment. I can trash the institutions. It's going to reduce their well-being, but I'm not a utilitarian. I don't have to do that calculus. I just have to work out whether I'm violating any of their rights. And I'm clearly not because they don't exist yet. Once they exist, then I can start doing the rights violations. But before they exist, how could I violate their rights? No, I don't think that, okay, I have a good answer for you, <laughs> but what, I didn't come up with it. Joel Feinberg did. So you can violate the rights of a future person very easily. This came up in the 90s when there were some wrongful life lawsuits based on companies that did genetic testing or produced birth control and people and people said, I should never have been born. And at first they got tossed out and they got, some of them made it through the courts. But one of the arguments was you cannot harm someone who doesn't yet exist. And Joel Feinberg says, of course you can. Let's say somebody plants a bomb in a kindergarten that is set to go off in 10 years. Then it, 10 years later, he blows up the kindergarten. He's like, well, by when I planted the bomb, nobody existed yet. So what? You can harm a future person. It's so you don't have to exist now in order for people to have obligations to you. You just have to be somebody that will exist in the future. And then we can discuss what the obligations are. But I think Feinberg's case, to me, is a convincing response to that claim. That I'm not kind of sure. Case. So I accept, and I think we both accept that you can reduce people, future people's well-being. You can affect their interests. You can harm them. You can make it worse off than it would have been if you hadn't done the action. That just strikes me as different from a rights violation. Unless you want to say that they have a right to a clean environment and they have a right to wonderful institutions, which seem like a non-standard kind of rights. 
It's not clear that you're violating anything by making the world worse off. They didn't have any of that stuff in the pre-existence. You haven't taken anything away from them. They're just born into a world that is suboptimal for them, but possibly to our benefit. In other words, we thought, let's rape the earth so we can get all these immediate benefits and the future generations find they're going to be worse off. But that's just a utilitarian problem. Us deontologists don't have to care about that. I don't think it gets you out of it. So the difference I see is Feinberg is because you're violating the check because you're killing somebody, actively taking away a life. And in this case, you don't. So why shouldn't you trash the environment? So you have to think of which policies, let's say we just decide we're going to bury the waste slovenly. And the future generations can say to us, you did not take our moral status into proper account because you don't, you could have done something, you should have thought of our well-being. These are so, but it's not as easy to run the case as it would be in a utilitarian perspective. You would have to, you would have to do more work, I agree, to think about what are our obligations to future people? What is the basis for them? It's not just rights violations we could talk about. Being Rawls talks about intergenerational distributive justice. You could try to use that sort of a framework. You will have to have a different framework, yes. And I see your point about Feinberg because it's a little bit easier because his case is a clear rights violation. So, and I think that's also accurate. It is not clear to me just to say future generations have a right for us to, let's say, save the earth for them to benefit this much, that much. I think we need to say, okay, what are the principles in play? What are the, what's the framework we're using? What's the principle of intergenerational savings? And those are things that we can work out from a deontological perspective also that sets up, let's say, a standard of care that we think we should uphold for future generations. And then if we fall, and we have to justify the standard. And then if you fall below the standard, you would be negligent. So that leaves a lot of work to do, but it's an avenue that you could, that you would use. But now you've given the utilitarian the foot in the door, right? So now the utilitarian says, when you're coming up with these principles, they're entirely ad hoc. And how you're coming up with them is just evaluating them against trying to prevent harms. That's really what you're doing. So, uh, so what you're doing is you're saying, okay, that future involves a lot of harm to these people. So let me, I don't want that to happen because harm's bad, but I won't say that because I'm not a utilitarian. So let me come up with a bunch of deontological principles that will prevent that from happening. But really, they're entirely arbitrary principles unless you use a harm calculus to determine whether you're going to hold them or not. I don't think that's correct. I think you can, I don't, when I think about the future and people not having enough things, I don't just think about harm. I think about my responsibility to future people and what it entails. That's why I don't have a quick answer. I would have to think about it. I would have to think about the principle I'm using and it would not be ad hoc. None of the principles I use ad hoc are ad hoc. In fact, that's one of the things I think is wrong with some utilitarians runaway demands. You have to give to the point of marginal utility. And I'm like, why do I have to give to anybody at all? Start from bedrock. I start from bedrock principles. And I think that our obligations to future generations will have to be grounded in them and they will not be simple and not just be harm, not harm. It will be based on, am I mistreating a future person, using them as a tool for my purposes? Am I not giving them sufficient respect for the ends they might want to pursue? So I would use the same principles and see how they applied out. And, and I don't think that the only thing we can think about is harm, especially when you're talking about things that involve a lot of prediction and speculation. I think harm is not the best way to think about it, partly because, partly because that's not your only obligation, it's not the only thing that matters, but also because uh, it involves a lot of things, a lot, a lot of guessing. So one proposed solution for the difficulty of bringing new beings into the world, given all the uncertainty, given all the risks, is instead to take beings that already exist and adopt them. And to say, I'm not going to take the dice roll. I'm not going to bring the new being to existence. There's this kid who needs parents. And so I'm just going to adopt them. Do you think this would be a good solution to the problem of bringing new beings into the world? Widespread adoption? No. I think it is a terrible solution for even more than one reason. So overdetermined. First reason is someone has to have the children. So this does not help anybody because you cannot adopt children that have not been born. Second of all, adoption is a is rife with its own problems. And 
it is often people like to think that they're doing a child this favor. They need to, why does a child need to adopt, be adopted? Most of the time, because the parents don't have the money to save that, to raise the child. It would probably cost less for you to give the parents, the biological parents, the money to raise the child than you're paying the adoption agency to adopt the child. So this whole saving a child by adopting them, I, it applies to much fewer children than we originally think. But basically, simply put, of course, you cannot solve the problem by adopting children because somebody has to have the children. Now, there are some cases where there is no, where the best case scenario is adoption. I think that there are cases like that. And in that case, if you have that opportunity, yes, you, it is more, more, then you get around this problem of bringing new people into the world. However, another problem with that is that, because I remember thinking about that. Uh, for myself. And I thought, but if I, if I adopt, there are not enough children to adopt based on how many people want to adopt people who are infertile, who can't have a child. So the other thing you're doing is taking that opportunity away from somebody who could not have a child biologically. So it, it is, um, that's another problem with adoption, but adoption generally, it doesn't solve the problem. It creates many of its own problems and also creates another category of people you are harming, which is the people who can't have children on their own biologically, who are looking at this small, I hate to say market, but it is a market because there's a lot of money involved in adoption. So I think there are many reasons why that is, there's a lot of, there's like a whole little philosophical cottage industry on this question, which is entirely hypothetical because there are very few children available for adoption and the lines for them go round and round the block. And so you're not really doing anybody a favor, and it also has its own problems, and somebody has to have the children. It's going to be contingent, though, right? So uh, perhaps that's the case in the States, but in South Africa, we have a huge number of, of orphan children who don't have adopted parents. And here you've got the other problem. So you've got not enough people applying. So would your calculus change there in this situation? Absolutely. Yes, if it was really the case that that you could that that the adoption would solve a problem rather than create a problem and then you would not have to impose risk on a new person then yes and then you would have to think what you are losing by procreating by having this parent child relationship but you would lose it would be a loss of a biological relationship which i think is a legitimate loss to, to think about and you would have to think about whether that's and whether whether you're obligated to have that loss whether it would be rational, you'd have to think, well, what child would I have? And would it be rational for me to, what kind of risks am I imposing? Would it be rational for me to accept those kinds of risks in exchange for the freedom to procreate biologically when I could adopt instead? That is a cost. It's a much smaller cost than, than procreating, than not having children at all and being able to adopt. So, so one of the ways that people cash out this distinction between having a biological child and having an adopted child in terms of the benefits to the parents is that some parents feel that their lives are more meaningful if they have a biological child. Is there any reason to believe that? I think there could be, because I think the continuation of a family line can mean something to people. It can have a significance or a value. I think there's a value to a biological relationship. I know a lot of people try to just say there isn't, but I see no reason to find that plausible. We're primates or animals and most people care about it. And so I do think that that it's something that doesn't mean it's everything. And there are plenty of biological relationships. So they're the worst ones that that we have in our lives and plan and no shortage of adoptive relationships that are very deep and very meaningful in different ways. Adoption gives you a different kind of meaning because you're stepping in to help somebody if that's truly the case, which I think it only is in a minority of cases. But I think that there is a legitimacy to say that there's different ways, so many ways for something to have meaning and biological relationship is one way. So I wanna explore the relationship that meaning can have with regards to bringing new beings into the world. Can you tell us a bit about the different kinds of meaning that you could have and what procreation can do to fulfill these kinds of meaning? Okay, so I think there's three kind I think that there are three kinds of meaning. There is what I call ultimate meaning, which is the point of running your life as this project that you do of its own. You run your life, you lead a life. And that is and the point of leading the life, the valued end, the purpose for which you're doing that would be ultimate meaning. I don't think anyone can have that. 
Everyday meaning is the meaning that you can have in your everyday life. It involves things like significance, value, impact, purpose, and point. That's everyday meaning. And then cosmic meaning is meaning based on your role in the cosmos. So if you look at having a child, it will not give you ultimate meaning because nothing's going to do that. Very sad. Whether it gives you cosmic meaning depends on what you think your role in the cosmos is. If you think your role in the cosmos is to populate this little corner of the galaxy with human beings, then maybe it adds to your cosmic meaning. I don't think cosmic meaning matters so much. I don't know why you should care so much about your role in the cosmos. What's the cosmos doing for you? I don't really understand that. And maybe you think you're doing God's will, but then why should you do God's will? Why doesn't God take care of himself? So I don't have, I don't think, I, I can see that some people think that having children enhances their cosmic meaning. I haven't seen a convincing case for that. Now, let's talk about everyday meaning. Having children is certainly of great significance to people. In fact, it's one of the best examples of significance because you care about almost everything about your kids. They don't have a friend you care. They lost their lunch you care. You wouldn't care if you lost your lunch or if you're missing your favorite, I don't know what, cassette of gloves, right? And if they're really suffering, you suffer terribly. So it's very significant to you. You value your child. You have love and intimacy. You have a great impact on your child. That's why you worry so much of every time say something that you shouldn't have said. And, oh, you're going to screw them up for life, which you are. And so you have an impact. And, it, and you have a purpose, you have this valued end, your child and the relationship with your child, and you can do a lot of things for that purpose and with that in mind. And so it can, and it also, another thing that, another aspect of meaning is explanation and having a child can make sense of a lot of the things you do. A lot of your life, you're doing it so your child can have a better life or your child can have basic things. You work so that you can feed your child. That renders your life explainable and coherent. And so these are all the ways in which having children really has a big, can be extremely meaningful in this everyday sense. And that is part of the reason why I think it is sometimes permissible to have a child, even though you're imposing such deep risks on the child and risks of some certain disappointments, like not having ultimate meaning because of how meaningful it makes your life in the everyday sense. But I'm guessing ultimate meaning is ultimate. It's really important. And so if you're bringing a being into the world that you know is going to have no ultimate meaning, even if your life is going to be filled with everyday meaning, and even if their lives, their, their, this child's life, this future child's life will be filled with everyday meaning, aren't you still doing something on balance wrong because ultimate meaning is ultimate? I, I'm not sure. I, don't, I, I think there's room for disagreement about the balance of these two kinds of meanings and which are more important. Some people are like, why do I care about ultimate meaning? I have everyday meaning. My life is full of meaning. It's rich with meaning. And I don't care if it's ultimately pointless. I think they're making a mistake. I think everyone should care. But I don't think that you have to care to the point of deciding that your everyday meaning is not doesn't make your lack of ultimate meaning worthwhile. I don't really know how. I, I don't have a good answer because I'm not sure. And I'm not sure how it weighs out. And I'm not sure there's only one way to decide which one is more important. But I do think that it's true that when you create a child, you're doing, you're putting a child in a position where you know they will not have ultimate meaning. Hopefully they will have everyday meaning. And the same conflict, the conflict just, I don't know how to resolve the conflict. And I'm not sure that there's only one way to look at it. I think it might be reasonable to look at it in different ways. Because I think that purpose is more important to certain kinds of people people who like work and like aiming at things and goals. And I think that there's at least that difference. That's not an objective difference, but a, maybe a temperamental difference or a psychological difference. So if I understand your account of ultimate meaning, the impossibility of ever attaining it is because you cannot ever step outside of your life. You can have various projects, those projects can have a point, but there can never be a grand point to your life. Now there's this Jewish Orthodox view about the nature of God, which is that in the beginning, all there was God, but for God to know itself, it had to create a separation. It had to create something different from itself. And so it splits. And then it is able to know itself through everything else. So God is everything, but there's also the separation. And I wonder if we can draw an analogy with the child, where the child is separate from you, but it is also like you in some kind of way. It is a way of stepping outside of your life and on that basis can give you ultimate meaning. I wonder if you think in the God case, 
that being who has divided itself and stepped outside of its own nature to observe itself and its creation has given itself ultimate meaning. Maybe in some way that the parent can't give itself ultimate meaning. So I think the reason that nobody, not even God, can have ultimate meaning is based on the nature of values that they lie outside the projects and the and the efforts toward which we aim them, and the nature and so and the nature of a life, which is that it includes its entirety. So even though we even though your child is outside of you, your value that you have for your child is in your life, not outside of it, and so that doesn't give your entire life a point. Now. I don't really understand the God case. So I'm not sure what I'm not answering about that. I don't understand what it means to, so if God is, so that means that we're God, people are God, we're like a piece of God. Yeah, that's and the claim. So God. that everything is part of God. God is able to know itself through you. And also the idea is that it's a panentheist view. So everything is housed inside of God, but if everything ceased to exist, God would still exist. So there's that separation uh, and that's why God can be outside of itself. Um, and that's why that being could have ultimate meaning. But the separation, the value is still within God's existence. It's not out, it's part of God's project. It's in it. So it doesn't give it the ultimate value. So the, the reason you cannot have ultimate meaning is because you have no, your life includes all the things you value. And so you have, so the project, the meta project of running your life has nowhere to reach outside of it for a value. I think the same thing would apply to the example of the God case that you gave, because the value would still be within God's running his own little project own little sadistic game that he seems to be playing with us on this scenario. And I don't think that would give God ultimate meaning either. I think, I think, I think ultimate meaning is metaphysically impossible, even for God. So right at the beginning of this discussion, when you were setting up your thought experiments, you mentioned Derek Parfit. And I wondered whether if you took a Parfitian line on personal identity, if you took his conception of personal identity, whether your view would fall apart. So his view of personal identity is that it's not one-to-one. So you can split and the borders of your life are porous and they move as people become more or less simi similar to you and as they enter into causal relations with you. So when you say your life is entirely within your life, I think he'd probably disagree with that. I think that, so he would disagree that, that you're, he disagrees that you have personal identity, period. It's not that it's porous. There's no such thing. I'm not sure what follows from that very bizarre view in a practical, realistic way. You know what I mean? So we don't exist. We're just these relations of, I think, values or something like that, or what we care about or things like that. But it's still, we're st so on that view, I guess we're not running a life project because we don't have a life, one life to lead, one life to run. I don't see that we could have ultimate value or ultimate meaning because ultimate meaning is about the meaning of the whole life you lead. So I guess you don't have that problem because you don't have a self and you're not leading a life. I don't know how it is to really live in a Parfitian way. Parfit said there's no personal identity, but there is continuity. So you do survive. You do continue but you don't necessarily continue as one thing you continue through a multiplicity you branch possibly some people don't the example i like to use is years ago my grandmother died and i inherited her dishwasher and her dishwasher has so many features of my grandmother it it uses up so much electricity that when the dishwasher switches on the lights pulse and it's just incredibly uneconomical but it washes those dishes so well and it's got its own personality and it groans at you and it grunts, but it does a great job. And it's very luxurious. And it's from like the eighties and it's just got so much of her personality in it. And in a way it makes me feel like my grandmother survives through that dishwasher. There's a bit of my grandmother in that dishwasher. Now, of course, that's a bit of a metaphor. I'm not sure we can survive through things, but I long after Mark is dead, I'll remember things that Mark has said and his views will have infected me with deontology and i'll have these at the back of my mind doubts about my wonderful utilitarianism thanks mark and in some way even though mark would be dead mark has survived through me 
there, it seems like if Mark's life, his whole purpose was to change my mind on utilitarianism, if that was his ultimate goal, it seems like then he's done it. There's bits of him that have bled into that. You can't say that it's all contained within his life. You can't say it's not. You said you can't see a reason why his life would have ultimate meaning. And I'm not going to argue that it would. But my point is your argument that it doesn't no longer works. I think it totally works. And I don't think you need any dishwashers or parfits to have this. We'll just go to right to your example of hopefully Mark is making you doubt your utilitarianism. And let's say he says the project of, so, and of course, that value of having an influence on you is something that is outside of him, but it is in his life. Otherwise, he would not care about it. And so I think the problem stays exactly the same, whether he's dead or alive, whether your grandmother's dishwasher is there or not, I don't see this as affecting what I'm saying. I don't see the I don't see it having an impact on the way I'm describing the problem. So maybe it's this is that you've drawn such a stern distinction between inside and outside of life. And Parfit would say, what do you mean by that? Like what's inside or outside the life? The project or effort of running or leading your life. Now, if you're going to say you don't have this project, then I think you're not really an agent. I don't know how much meaning applies to you. And I think you have like, you don't have ultimate meaning either. And now I'm not sure about your everyday meaning. So I don't think this helps. But I also think it's very difficult to think about meaning if you're thinking of people as these kind of parfait little pouches of values or whatever else he's thinking of people as. I think it's really hard to imagine that. But I don't think it makes things more meaningful, certainly because it drains your agency or it makes it more diffuse. Do you think there's anything to the claim that we could, from the perspective of the universe, add up how much meaning there is? Does that make sense to talk about this sort of abstract notion where we're adding up how much meaning we have generated from that perspective? No, because I don't think... It's quite, I don't think it's measurable in that way. There's so many different ways for things to have meaning and different kinds of meaning. I guess I, I can't say it's conceptually impossible. I don't know what the point of it would be. I would have to, you know, I, I don't know how it would work, but I wouldn't have high hopes for it. And I also would think, why would we need to do that? Like, what would be the point of that? Couldn't we assess two different worlds and say that one is a more meaningful world than another? or one is a more meaningful society than another without knowing the particular goals of each of the individuals in that world. I quite like Mark's idea, because I'm a closet Poffitian, about the idea of this floating meaning, the same way as utilitarians are really concerned with the state, right? So the state of things, the state of affairs. Couldn't we talk about meaning in that way, that it floats on top of, as you say, these pockets of, of value? I wouldn't talk about it that way because I think it vests in a valuer, a person, or some other kind of sentient thing. But I do think that even though I don't think it's, I don't think that it's realistic to think about measuring meaning. I don't think you have to measure meaning in order to say, let's say, if you look at two societies and one is like making mistakes about value and just valuing on like the American dream of a white picket fence and a house and a dog. That's that's not as meaningful as, let's say, a society that's more interested in having a lot of art and love and knowledge. So you could say that's because the value is misplaced because I'm an objectivist about value and what could have meaning. So in that sense, you could compare societies, but I don't think you have to disembody the meaning for it. So I, I still don't, I'm not, I still don't see the like states of affairs. When you talk about state, like a more meaningful state of affairs, I'm not, I, ha, I wouldn't put it in those terms of a state of affairs because that's, where is the meaning in just this state? I don't think that's how meaning works. I think meaning has to have valuers, but I'm not, there are, there's ways of thinking about this that take the valuers out. Some people argue that nature is beautiful and meaningful, even if there's nobody to appreciate it. And there's some arguments for that seem possible. So I wouldn't be too wedded to the things I'm just saying recently. I'm not sure about them completely. I think that, but I do think you could say one society can be, you can compare sometimes because the differences can be so obvious that I think you could do. Yeah, one of the debates that I've had with friends is 
you can imagine that there's a world filled with beautiful artistic objects and there are no perceivers on that world and that it would be a bad thing if that world ceased to exist that even though there's no one there that could perceive the beauty or the, the wonderful stuff on it it popping out of existence would somehow be regrettable so there's a book oh i wish i remembered the name of the guy it's called on the intrinsic value of everything and the author is slipping my mind and he argues it's a little book and he says if you want to know if something has value for its own sake think of it if it would be a loss if it disappeared and so he thinks there would be a loss like a paper clip no more paper clips that would be sad it would be a loss it would be a deficit and so in that way you can think of everything as having value for its own sake including the beautiful things but that's really a question about a different kind of a question about whether value depends on a valuer and i i don't have a formed answer for that question i think that's a different kind of a question than questions about procreation or meaning so i want to ask you the ultimate question so the ultimate question is you've got at least two three different types of values that we've discussed in this podcast so you've got meaning you've got morality and you've got rationality and my understanding is you want to reduce morality to rationality to some degree which one wins so when you're just determining whether to have this child, whether you're determining whether or not to make a certain decision, and there's these sometimes competing values, sometimes meaning goes one way, rationality goes another way, or meaning and morality go another way, which one wins? Now, I'm asking you this question with vested interest because this is a continuous debate between Mark and I about which values win. I'm going to settle this for you right now. Okay, so a few things. Morality is a constraint. So it's not a winner or a loser. If you don't make the mistake of being a utilitarian, you don't have to worry about this. Morality just constrains what you can do. So that's how it operates. Now we're left with, what was the other one? Meaning and? Rationality, I guess. So rationality, if you're a deontologist, is morality, also a constraint. So you go ahead and pursue your meaning constrained by morality. No content. It's not the answer I want. It's exactly Mark's line, and it's not the answer I want. <laughs> want but it is the answer. <laughs> the other thing I want to say, is, this reminds me a little bit of Susan Wolf's book about meaning, where she's very well known for saying, which she does say, that meaning is subjective engagement with objective value. But the framework for her book is that she's really arguing that there's another dimension to something that counts, to value. There's moral value. And then, which is like, there's this is the way she puts it, there's self-interest, caring about other people, and fulfillment, which she calls meaning. I don't agree with that way of thinking about things at all. I think that there is there's self-interest and there's interest, there's interpersonal interest. I don't think meaning comes in as a separate kind of value system. I think meaning includes a lot of the things that you properly value in your moral life. Some of them play a big role. That depends on your moral system. But you have meaning, and then you have morality that constrains your pursuit of meaning. So you can't make a beautiful thing that's going to make people suffer, maybe, because there's a constraint against it. And that's, and rationality and morality are really just two ways of saying the same thing. So you have meaning or anything else you want to do with your life constrained by morality. You don't need to rank. It's not how it works. <laughs>